Thanks to CuriosityStream for keeping Legal Eagle in the air. I don't know about you, but it seems like every celebrity wants their own trademark these days. The summer of 2019 was filled with such celebrity trademark news as Tom Brady wanting to trademark Tom Terrific for some reason. LeBron James filed an application to register the trademark for Taco Tuesday. And Lizzo says she's the only one who can call herself 100% that bitch. Sure, it's all fun and games until LeBron James takes away your right to send pictures of your food with the hashtag Taco Tuesday to your friends. Here comes LeBron! So what is going on with celebrities and the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office anyway? Hey, Legal Eagles, today we are talking about celebrity trademarks. But first, what is a trademark? Well, a trademark is a word, symbol, or phrase that's used to identify a particular manufacturer or a particular product to distinguish them from the products of another company or person. For example, Coke and Pepsi have different logos. That's how you can be assured that you are grabbing a delicious Diet Coke rather than a clearly inferior Diet Pepsi. Though obviously we can all agree that Dr. Pepper is by far the best carbonated soda out there. Now, the federal law that protects trademarks used in commerce is called the Lanham Act. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, or USPTO for short, is in charge of granting federal trademark protection. Trademarks are often confused with copyright, but they're two very different concepts and they cover different rights. Copyright protects original works of creative authorship fixed in a tangible medium. That means that authors and artists have the exclusive right to do whatever they want with the things that they make for a limited amount of time. Whether that's a book, a song, a movie, a photograph, a sculpture, or anything else that qualifies for copyright protection. For example, if you write a novel, you don't need to register your book or ask the government to provide a certificate proving that you wrote it. Once your book is fixed in a tangible medium, in other words, it's written down in some form, it's protected by copyright law and no one else can copy your book or adapt it for the big screen, for instance, without your permission. Trademarks, on the other hand, are very different. They don't cover creative expression per se. A trademark is not about rewarding the trademark holder. The goal of trademark protection is not just to protect the person or business from having their trademark stolen. It's all about preventing consumer confusion. If you own the rights to a certain trademark, you can sue someone else from using a trademark that seems similar to yours to prevent consumers from being confused. To prove that someone infringed on your trademark, you need to show that it's likely to cause consumer confusion about the source of the product or service at issue. Let me give you an example. Adidas has trademark marked its distinctive three-stripe logo, which it places on everything from shoes to hats to track pants. Forever 21 sells trendy clothes, including sometimes clothes that seem to have the same three-stripe pattern that you would usually find on Adidas clothes. Adidas sued for copyright infringement in 2017. The problem was that the striped sweats that Forever 21 was selling looked exactly like authentic Adidas clothes. It looked like something Adidas would actually produce. The parties eventually settled out of court, but it's very likely that Adidas would have won that suit. With a trademark, the point is to make sure that consumers know who made the product or service. When you see the familiar Adidas stripe pattern on clothes, you know what kinds of products they sell and the values associated with that particular brand. You can also trademark phrases and packaging, things like short phrases and even single words that would never be protected by copyright because they're too short and not creative enough that actually might qualify for trademark protection, again, for the purpose of preventing consumer confusion. For a mark to qualify for registration with a trademark office, it needs to be distinctive. This is based on how well the trademark identifies the source or manufacturer of a certain product or service. There are four types of distinctive marks. Fanciful marks are inherently distinctive because they have no meaning outside of that which is gained in the context of selling a good or service. The word Google, for example, doesn't mean anything. It's just a made up name that is now associated with an internet service provider. The same is true of Kodak, Xerox, or Exxon. These are the strongest kinds of trademarks because they don't have any meaning outside of the trademark itself. The next strongest form of mark is an arbitrary mark, which is something that already has a common meaning, but doesn't have a connection to the goods or services being sold. Apple is a fruit, but it's also a computer. Lotus is a software, but it's also a plant. These are highly protectable because they are arbitrary compared to the thing being sold. Next, there are suggestive marks, which refer to some quality or characteristic of the good. A Jaguar, for example, is a name of a 
super sleek cat, but that's also why the car company chose that name to associate the characteristics of the cat with its cars. And then finally, we have descriptive trademarks, which simply describe the service or goods. A descriptive trademark is weak since it doesn't do anything to identify the source of the product or service, or it's pretty hard to create that identification. If something is merely descriptive, it will not qualify for registration. So for example, if I start a bowl company named Cereal Bowl, it's mm. unlikely the USPTO would grant me a trademark. I could still use Cereal Bowl for my company name, but I'd have a hard time stopping others from using it because it's merely a descriptive mark. But if I called a new clothing company Cereal Bowl, that would be an arbitrary mark and could be very strong because why would you associate the words Cereal Bowl with a clothing company? It's arbitrary and it's very likely to be able to identify Cereal Bowl clothes. Ugh, God, I'm so hungry for some cereal and some Dr. Pepper right now. In addition to the distinctiveness requirement for any particular mark, you also have to use the mark in commerce before you can get protection from the USPTO. Trademark has sort of a use it or lose it provision. Now, in some cases you can declare your intent to use a mark and get protection, but that's temporary and still requires use in commerce in the short term. Now, say you have two similar marks. The question is whether there would be a likelihood of consumer confusion between the two marks. On top of that, even if the two marks are very, very similar, in fact, sometimes they can be identical using exactly the same words, a likelihood of confusion will only be found to exist where the goods or the underlying services are in fact connected or related. What most people get wrong about trademark is that a trademark only covers a narrow set of goods or services. Just because you have a trademark over a specific word doesn't mean that you can monopolize that word throughout the entire universe. You only get potential control over similar goods or services that use a confusingly similar mark in commerce. That's why wolf ranges can exist at the same time as wolf clothing, or why Apple Records, which was started by the Beatles, could exist at the same time as Apple Computers, which was started by Steve Jobs. Though that's probably not a great example because Apple Records and Apple Computers sued each other for decades. Although maybe it is a good example because in the 1970s, computers didn't really have anything to do with music. So there was no real overlap between Apple Records and, and Apple Computers. But as computers became able to make and play music, overlap was created, especially when Apple computers started making iPods and the iTunes music store. At that point, it was very possible that consumers might be confused between the two marks. For example, if you heard the phrase Apple music in 2005, odds are you probably thought of Steve Jobs rather than Paul McCartney. And that's why Apple records and Apple computers were in lawsuits with each other for the better part of 40 years. Here's another example, since I have tennis on the brain, since the US Open is currently on. Roger Federer is one of the most popular and famous tennis players of all time. His name and likeness are powerful for selling goods, and it gives him the ability to get paid big bucks to endorse products like Rolex, Lint Chocolates, Uniqlo, and Nike. If Roger Federer could not protect his name and likeness, then maybe I could show up at the US Open selling special socks supposedly endorsed by Roger Federer. And I'm sure I'd be able to sell a lot of them. Trademarks are about preventing market confusion. My Federer socks could hoodwink a lot of people. And it's exactly that reason why the USPTO denied trademark registration for Rob Kardashian's ex, Black China, when she tried to take the Kardashian name. Black China tried to register the name Angela Kardashian when she was engaged to Rob Kardashian. His sisters successfully blocked her attempt to register that trademark. The various Kardashian companies and Kardashian people have powerful brands that have generated hundreds of millions of dollars. The USPTO agreed with the Kardashians that if Black China started endorsing products with the name Angela Kardashian, the product would inevitably be considered part of the Kardashian brand. In particular, that's called trademark dilution because you are diluting the power of that particular mark. And in that particular instance, that's probably considered trademark passing off where you're trying to pass off your goods as being affiliated with somebody else. And both of those are no-nos as far as trademark law goes. But it was easy to see why Black China was eager to capitalize on that name. And it was also easy to see why the Kardashians wanted to stop her. So let's talk about some of these celebrity trademark names that are in the news today. As the would be Angela Kardashian recognized, registering a name has become increasingly popular. However, to really enjoy the protections of trademark law, you have to promise to use that name in commerce. 
If you don't use the name, your trademark will disappear. You'll abandon that trademark. Many celebrities have been criticized for trying to trademark their kids' names. They usually say that they have no intention of ever making money on the name of their child. They just want to be able to stop other people from capitalizing on their children's name. But this legal tactic doesn't really work since trademarks are given specifically for uh, use in commerce. You have to use them to get a trademark. And even then, they would only apply to similar goods. Are children goods? No. No, they are not. So it didn't go well for Beyonce and Jay-Z when they tried to register the mark for their daughter, Blue Ivy. A Boston company called Blue Ivy Elements beat them to the punch, demonstrating that they had used the mark Blue Ivy since at least 2009. And four years later, the Carters tried again, this time trying to register Blue Ivy Carter. But they insisted the reason that they needed the trademark was to stop others from using it. Once again, Blue Ivy Events contested the filing, and they accused the Carters of trademark fraud since they claimed to have no intention of actually using the name for goods or services. And once again, the Carters were defeated because you can't just try to monopolize a particular name. Which brings us to whether Tom Brady can trademark the term Tom Terrific. Nickname actually can be eligible for trademark. That was clearly what Tom Brady thought when he tried to file the trademark registration for the nickname Tom Terrific. When Brady's registration attempt became public, he backpedaled claiming that he just wanted to stop people from associating the name with him because he thought it was stupid. I was actually trying to do something because I didn't like the nickname and I wanted to make sure no one used it because some people wanted to use it. What? That makes absolutely no legal sense. When you file a trademark, you have to show that it is closely associated with the thing you intend to use it for in the marketplace. Not that you are hoping that people will never call you Tom Terrific and that you want the trademark specifically to stop people from using it and that you yourself will never use it because you hate that particular nickname. I would love to hear the communications between Brady and his lawyer. Did he just call him up and say, hey, some guy on ESPN saw my comeback last week and is now calling me Tom Terrific? Send that guy a cease and desist letter. Not surprisingly, we already know what the USPTO thinks of this particular Brady trademark registration because it has already denied the application. The USPTO not only noticed that he, Brady had no intent to really use it in commerce, but also the nickname includes a matter which may falsely suggest a connection to Tom Seaver. Tom Seaver, for those of you who are younger than the age of 70, is a former Major League Baseball pitcher who started for the 1969 Mets. He was so good that the media gave him the nicknames Tom Terrific and the franchise. Because of that, the USPTO held that, quote, the Mark Tom Terrific points uniquely and unmistakably to Tom Seaver and the fame or reputation of Tom Seaver as Tom Terrific is such that a connection between Mr. Seaver and the applied for goods would be presumed. Again, the USPTO is telling us that consumer confusion is key. Products featuring the nickname could make you think Seaver endorsed or approved them. And the USPTO also thought it was significant that Seaver is alive and didn't consent to the Brady trademark registration. This is the kind of misuse of the legal system that really grinds my gears. Brady's attempt to grab the trademark was an attempt to control speech. He just wanted people to not call him Tom Terrific. But frankly, I don't think we can let this stand. Even though Brady is on my fantasy football team, let's start a movement to start calling him Tom Terrific Brady. Hashtag Tom Terrific Brady. Which brings us to famous catchphrases like Taco Tuesday. It is possible to trademark certain catchphrases, but only for the protection of its use in connection with goods or services. Just saying a catchphrase doesn't make it something that you can register, but you can use the catchphrase in connection with goods and services. You can also stop someone else from profiting from your catchphrase in a similar industry. When it comes to registering catchphrases, Taylor Swift is a frequent filer. She has filed trademark applications for the names of her albums, like Reputation, lyrics from her songs, like The Old Taylor Can't Come to the Phone Right Now, and even the name of her world tours, like the 1989 World Tour. But Swift doesn't always win registration for her trademarks. That's because in order to get them, you need to prove that it's more than just a thing that they, she said one time. Which brings us to LeBron. Can LeBron James register Taco Tuesday? One of LeBron's companies filed a trademark application on August 15th, stating that he intended to use the term Taco Tuesday in his business ventures. LeBron has had a fun summer Instagramming his family's enjoyment of weekly taco meals. It's Tuesday somewhere, so you know what that means. It's Taco Tuesday! So much fun that his company says he intends to start an empire of products and podcasts using the phrase. 
But LeBron's quest may be as doomed to failure as his first season as a Laker. That's right, I said it. A Wyoming restaurant called Taco John's got the Taco Tuesday trademark way back in 1982. Taco John's is a small Western franchise, but it has defended its trademark with some success. However, the trademark is considered relatively weak since it's merely descriptive. It isn't fanciful or original. It's a phrase that many people have used for decades to describe the fact that they're eating tacos on Tuesdays. And it's not necessarily something that you hear and immediately think I should go to Taco John's right now. That's probably why restaurants everywhere have used Taco Tuesdays in promotions. So LeBron is starting with two strikes. One is that another company already uses the trademark Taco Tuesday. And two, the trademark is descriptive of something that people do. They eat a bunch of tacos on Tuesday. It isn't truly associated with LeBron or his products in any particular way. As a result, the USPTO is likely to deny LeBron's trademark the same way that they denied Brady. So finally, that takes us to Lizzo. Lizzo is taking the world by storm in 2019, so the singer decided to take things to the next level by applying for a trademark for the phrase 100% that bitch from her song Truth Hurts. I just took a DNA test, turns out I'm 100% that bitch. Lizzo says that she intends to to use the phrase on clothing and entertainment services. Some people have called out Lizzo because she didn't invent the phrase. As far as anyone knows, the first person to gain traction with that phrase on the internet was singer Mina Leonis, who tweeted back in 2017, quote, I did a DNA test and I found out I'm 100% that bitch, which I probably don't need to tell you is hilarious. Mina's tweet became a viral moment and an incredibly popular meme. So yes, it's true that Lizzo didn't invent the phrase, but does that prevent her from filing a trademark? Not really. This isn't a copyright claim where originality and creativity are incredibly important and where you can use that kind of protection to stop another person from stealing their work. That phrase is probably so short that it wouldn't receive copyright protection. So the verdict? Well, in trademark law, we're most interested in whether a person has claimed a mark as their own by using it in commerce. Mina had a viral moment, but didn't do anything with it as far as goods or services go. She didn't start a company with that name. She didn't slap it on some t-shirts uh, or even use it in the title of her next album. So that probably means it's fair game for Lizzo, provided that she actually uses it for a bona fide reason in goods or services that she provides. Now, Tom Terrific Brady is great, isn't he? Or if you don't live in Boston, maybe you just think he's 100% that bitch. Either way, he's not the perfect athlete. If creating the perfect athlete is something that you're interested in, there is a fascinating documentary on Curiosity Stream called The Quest for the Perfect Athlete. It's about how psychocognitive training is carried out in certain professional teams to push athletes even further, to win world records and Super Bowls and World Series. So someday, Tom will be even more terrific. It is a great watch and one of thousands of documentaries you can watch on CuriosityStream. It's the first streaming service that exclusively streams documentaries and educational videos and was created by the founders of the Discovery Channel. With them, you can watch these docs on almost every platform, including Android and Apple TV. Unlimited access on CuriosityStream is only $2.99 per month, but the best part is that you can start watching CuriosityStream for free for 30 days by signing up at curiositystream.com slash Legal Eagle and using the code Legal Eagle at checkout. Using the promo code really helps out the channel. Again, that's curiositystream.com slash Legal Eagle. So click on the link in the doobly-doo and get CuriosityStream for free for 30 days. But what do you guys think? Do you think that celebrities are uh, out of line by trying to trademark these phrases and names? Or do you think it is a perfectly reasonable way to protect against consumer confusion? Leave your objections in the comments and check out this playlist over here where I have all of my other real law reviews where we talk about all of the pressing legal issues of the day. So click on the playlist and I'll see you in court.